later, we've got another module for you from our cardiac surgical nursing e-learning, which is at csu-ls.org. Click on Learning Central, down to the icon that has all our resources, and away you go. So you can see two-minute clips on Twitter. We're putting longer clips on Facebook and YouTube. And of course, the best way to have a look at it is either go straight to the website and get going or ask your hospital to get you free codes. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this module. This section looks at the patient arriving in the intensive care unit. So normally the nurse in charge would be notified from theatre staff when a patient is likely to arrive in ICU and they may or may not at this point give you some more infor information about how the surgery has gone. So the normal pathway for a patient following cardiac surgery is to be transferred to an intensive care unit for a period of time and that time may vary depending on what centre you work in. For example, uh, the normal pathway may be to spend one night in the intensive care unit, so the patient uh, has been monitored closely, they've warmed up, they've woken, they've been extubated, they're hemodynamically stable and they're transferred to a step-down unit or higher acuity area the next day where they continue to be monitored. Or it may be that uh, you have the ability to fast track a patient on the day of surgery. So again, the patient will be transferred to the intensive care unit. Uh, say they arrive at 12 midday, and then over those next sort of two to six hours, again, they are warmed up, uh, woken, weaned from the ventilator, extubated, and they sort of follow a planned progression and they meet certain criteria to then be uh, transferred again to a step down unit on the day of surgery. Uh, so this depends on the centre that you are with. So why intensive care? Why do they come to intensive care? So again, they're kept fairly closely monitored. They're a specialist uh, nursing and uh, medical personnel here to care for uh, these patients. It may be that you work in a intensive care that only deals with patients following cardiac surgery, a CVICU, or it may be that you work in a, mix, in a mixed uh, intensive care unit. So you have general patients as well as cardiac surgery patients and are rotated around. So bear in mind the patient has had quite a big anaesthetic they have been cooled, uh, they have this induced hypothermia that you would have uh, learnt about earlier on in this uh, course, which has a protective effect uh, on, the, on the patient, predominantly on their heart and brain. They are intubated uh, and we want to monitor them closely. Hemodynamic uh, instability and complications, if they are to occur, uh, are more likely in the immediate post-operative phase. So being closely monitored means that uh, potential problems can be identified and addressed in a timely manner. And for this reason, patients return to the ICU sedated and ventilated. So on immediate arrival to the intensive care unit, it's common practice to do a couple of things uh, upon, you know, before a formal handover. So one of the things we want to do is to connect the patient to the ICU ventilator. And we do this according to the anaesthetist's uh, guidelines or instructions. Um, following this, we want to ensure that the patient is breathing adequately. So we're looking to see that the chest is rising and falling. We're looking to see that our CO2 trace as appropriate, that they have good saturations, that the tidal volumes are being met that are being set on the ventilator. The other thing we may do at this time is connect the monitoring equipment to the bedside monitor. So this includes a, a heart rate and rhythm, any invasive pressures, uh, so the arterial uh, waveform, uh, blood pressure, uh, central venous pressure, and if they have a pulmonary artery catheter, that this waveform is also transduced uh, to our bedside monitor. The next thing we'd like to do is make sure that our chest drains are attached to suction, and this is to help um, drain any air fluid blood from that pericardial, uh, pleural, mediastinal space. So uh, attaching them to uh, suction is very important. And we also want to take note here just how much blood loss there is in the drains when they arrive. So uh, from theatre to intensive care, how much blood has drained. So those are the main things that we think about on immediate arrival. 
So during the handover process, it's very important to minimise distractions so that everyone can listen to the handover at once. Remember, you've already um, attached the patient to the ventilator. You have the bedside monitor with um, with all the um, observations up there and you've already got your chest drains attached to suction. So people at the handover will be the primary nurse, the primary intensive care nurse looking after the patient and they may have a second nurse there also helping them uh, admit the patient to an ICU. Generally the uh, surgeon or and registrar and the anaesthetist are there uh, to hand over and often the nurse in charge or coordinator for that shift is there listening to the handover as well. So as I've said before you want to minimise distractions so everyone can listen to the handover. So at this time the anaesthetist may give a handover and the cardiac surgeon may also give a handover. The information that you're, that you're wanting to hear and uh, at this stage are the patient details and history, um, so significant health history and specifically the cardiac history that has led them up to having the operation. Uh, for instance, you know, did they have a positive exercise tolerance test? Have they had an ST um, myocard elevated myocardial infarction recently? Have they had stents previously? Have they had endocarditis. Uh, they had rheumatic heart disease leading to endocarditis. This is particularly uh, common uh, in New Zealand. What operation did they have? Uh, was it valves? Which valves were done? Were they replaced by a tissue valve or a mechanical valve? Uh, bypass grafts, how many and what was the conduit used? Did they use the internal mammary artery? Did they use a radial graft, uh, vein grafts? So again, this information is passed on. Uh, for instance, it's quite good to know if they've had a radial graft used as one of their conduits, then you're looking to make sure that the uh, limb to which that radial uh, graft um, artery perfused, is it warm, is it being perfused post-surgery. Uh, the surgeon will also indicate if there were any uh, difficulties or complications uh, during surgery. For instance, when they were coming off bypass, did they go into VF or VT? Were they, did they require to be shocked? Were they given amiodarone? Did they have to reopen because there was a bit too much bleeding, so they decided to go back in and have another look before closing again? All of those things are communicated at this time. Uh, they will let you know the current infusions that the patient has come back on, uh, the inotropes and the vasopressors uh, and sedation. For instance, uh, noradrenaline, vasopress and milrinone, dibutamine. Most uh, patients, the sedation of choice uh, that they come back on is propovol. Uh, epicardial wires, are they present? They're not always um, inserted following cardiac surgery for every patient. Do they have atrial and ventricular wires in or just ventricular wires? Uh, have they been tested? Are they working appropriately? So recently we had a patient that came back who had atrial and ventricular wires and we were told that the atrial wire was stimulating the diaphragm. Uh, so they it still works but of course if the patient is awake that's going to be quite painful. So it was left there uh, to use in an emergency but it's good to know these things prior uh, to handover or during handover. Chest drains. What drains are inserted? Are they plural, mediastinal? Did they come back on a balloon pump? Quite often, uh, if the patient has a balloon pump pre-op, then they come back on a balloon pump post-op. Uh, any allergies? And the surgeon or registrar will, uh, will ring the family or next of kin just to let them know how the operation has gone. Uh, and it's good to know that that phone call has been made. So generally speaking, uh, the first few hours when a patient gets back or has been transferred to intensive care are generally quite busy um, going through the things that need to be done. So once you've had that handover, you're wanting to do, it, to do a systematic uh, check, uh, including safety checks and a head to toe sort of physical assessment as well. So safety checks will include your airway adjuncts, that you've got the right uh, emergency equipment there, a Goodell airway or oropharyngeal airway, the appropriate mask, an ambi bag. 
Uh, you've got suction working appropriately and oxygen working appropriately. You're wanting to zero all your invasive pressures, uh, so your arterial line, your central venous pressure line, and your pulmonary artery pressure uh, line if you have one. You're checking your alarm limits on your um, bedside monitor as well to make sure they're set at appropriate targets. Chest drainage, you're really wanting to keep a close eye on chest drainage in the immediate few hours post um, transfer to ICU. And generally uh, speaking, mo you know, this is every 15 minutes for the first few hours, getting that hourly total. Anything sort of over 200 mils, you'd be looking to communicate this to the nurse in charge or the registrar. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the complications. We know post-cardiac surgery is bleeding, so we want to get onto this fairly quickly. All patients will have a chest X-ray. This is to ensure that the endotracheal tube is in the right place, sitting just above the carina, uh, that if you've got a nasogastric tube in situ, that this is in the right place, a central venous uh, catheter, Again, that all lines and drains are looking okay, so giving you a baseline of where things are. You'll do an ECG, again, to uh, have as a baseline to compare to further ECGs further down the track. Now, if you have a patient that's come back and they are being paced, uh, and they're dependent on that pacing because you've been told that they don't have any underlying rhythm, then the ECG will not give you any information. It's just going to show you the pacing spike. So just be aware of that, that you can't um, do a ECG if someone doesn't have an adequate underlying rhythm. Also, just check your catheter, your indwelling catheter. Often um, when patients come back, they can be, you know, when they've transferred the patient across to the bed, they're lying on the catheter, it's kinked. Just make sure that it's out, that it's draining uh, appropriately. So I hope you enjoyed that clip of our nurses e-learning course, which is at csu-als.org. Uh, if you want more, then we're going to post more from time to time on Twitter, on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. Of course, the best way uh, is to get on the uh, website and get going with the actual full course over 40 modules of fantastic content from nurses all over the world. Thanks a lot for your attention.